Ah, it's tabletop time. Welcome to the very first hardcore, actual, totally all about roleplay video that isn't us roleplaying. Um, this video is going to be a little trial of something that we thought might be a little bit helpful, which is a mix of me creating the first D&D characters that have been created for tabletop time for use in a little one shot that we're going to be running, but also guiding you, the viewer, through a couple of ways to create your characters. This is intended for people who I guess aren't too familiar with creating their characters and might be diving into the very first time they're doing it. I'm not going to go into all the deep detail and deep dive about every single possible sort of like variant or class or anything like that. I'm just going to show you A, the characters that we're making, but also B, three different ways to make the characters themselves. Uh, and those three different ways are traditionally grabbing a bit of paper and filling it out, using the PDF stat filler and also D&D Beyond. So uh, hopefully you You'll stick with us and see the amazing characters that the guys came up with. So you're gonna be, sorry, you're gonna be a cleric without armor. Mm hmm. Cool. No worries. So before starting out any of the characters, I wanted to briefly talk about the sort of different ways you can start out a character. I could go on for maybe 15 minutes talking about the various like benefits and various downsides to the different methods of building a character, but it boils down to three major types. One is called point buy, where you have a set allotment of points to distribute into your attributes. One is called standard array, where there is an array of preset numbers. And the third method is rolling for stats. I won't dive too much into it, but personally, Personally, I am not a fan of rolling for stats. I think it makes player dynamics very unbalanced if one player rolls a really bad set of stats and one player rolls a really good set of stats. So to that end, I'm personally a fan of just point by. It gives you the most freedom and allows you to make some fairly decently tooled characters into a fairly like linear path if you want them, while not excessively making your character weak or strong based on RNG. So all three methods today will be using point buy, which is effectively you get 27 points put into your attributes. They all start at eight and any point above 13 costs two points to invest in. Now, this sounds like a lot of math and that's why I like to use tools to aid me with it. Luckily, we live in the age of the internet now, so there are lots out there. This particular one is on a website called chickendinner.com, but if you just Google 5e point by calculator, there's a lot out there that you can use. Here we have the point by for Jazz's barbarian character. He is playing a variant human, and variant human means that he gets a feat to start with, but then I also get to select a couple of attributes, and you can see here uh, the list. So for him, I will be picking strength and I will be picking probably constitution, but I can change that at any stage. You can see down the bottom that it has a total points spent out of 27. So if I rapidly churn this one up, uh, it rapidly eats up those points. Now, I've actually got this set to be a custom one where there's no cap on your point buy, but traditionally it's actually capped at 15. So that's where I'm going to be treating it as the cap. So the most you can buy is up to 15 points. So we'll max out strength because hey, he's a barbarian. He needs maxed out strength. It's important to me. And I think we're going to go maxed con because why not? And then pump up that deck. I think wisdom should be probably a little bit higher. And that gets us to 22. He's playing a barbarian that is like begrudgingly retired as a clerk. So I feel like having low charisma is very appropriate for someone who hasn't spent their time much in the city. And I don't think he should be particularly intelligent. So we've gone for pretty much optimized combat stats. At least one of them has to be competent in combat. You can see here that the point by calculator has really easily set up those ability scores. It's allowed me to put all the points into them. You can see down the bottom, 27 out of 27. So we're pretty much much ready to go. I'm going to be using the traditional method of just pen and paper, but having this tool online makes it so much easier for me to set out my stats. And now when I dive into actually using pen and paper, it will be super easy for me to just transcribe these. Okay, so Jazza had chosen a barbarian by the name of Breag Tempestrong. Now his barbarian as described was sort of a guy from the wilds who was retiring into the city, but we knew he was barbarian and he was going to be level three. All the player characters in this little one shot will be level three. 
One of the first things I like to do with my classes is add the class features. One of those being the proficiencies. Proficiencies in D&D is basically what your character is extra good at, what they're trained at, and your proficiency bonus goes up with your level. So what you basically do is check out what saving throws you're proficient with and then fill in that little circle next to the name on the paper, marking that you're proficient with that skill. And your class will give you some of these and so will your race occasionally, but also your background. So for Jazz's character, I chose the hermit background because he said he'd lived out of the city his whole life and he'd only just come back into it, which gives him religion and medicine in addition to the investigation and survival that I chose for Jazza. I actually chose investigation because I like the idea that he's come back and got a job as sort of a repossessor. So he goes around, has to like find goods and then get them back for some employer. That's his new job in the city. And then from there, I added in some attributes. Now the attributes I got from the online point buy system, and I just filled them in, making sure to remember his feet, which gave an extra constitution, which brought it up to 16. That feat was Tavern Brawler. The Tavern Brawler basically makes your unarmed strikes do more damage and makes you proficient with improvised weapons. So smashing chairs over people's heads. And I thought that was kind of the ultimate way to make Jazz's rage out barbarian. Now you can add in your particular class features onto the page. Uh, but before I did that, I just filled in the little bits of information Information. So you add the proficiency bonus to the attribute score if you're proficient with a skill. Otherwise, your roles are just the attribute score. So I filled in all of the little skills and the saving throws as a quick guide for Jazza. So when he's rolling his dice, he just needs to refer to the number. If it's negative one, he would subtract one from the dice roll, positive three, add three to the dice roll, etc. Rounding out the last important statistics on the character sheet for this sort of brisk overview is uh, we have the armor class, the initiative, the speed, and the hip points. Now barbarians have a feature that means they can add their constitution to their dexterity modifiers and add that to the base of 10 if they're unarmored. And Jazza had already said that his character was unarmored. So he gets an AC of 15 due to his healthy dexterity and con scores. Initiative modifier is just your dexterity modifier, which Braggs is plus two. A speed of 30 is the standard speed for humans and a hit point maximum of 35. We were just taking the average. So aside from your first level where you get your maximum hit dice, which for a barbarian is a d12 plus your con so that's 12 plus 3 so he got 15 and then you get the upper end of half so a d12 the upper end of half is 7 so at level 1 he got 15 health then 10 for each additional level and he's level 3 leading to a hit point maximum of 35. I then filled out his weapons, fists and improvised. Both of them he's proficient with, so he would get plus five to hit. That's plus five onto the d20 you roll. As well as doing the damage, his fists now doing d4 damage, plus three for his strength. Thanks to Tavern Brawl. I put a little question mark on the improvised there. That's basically because if a improvised weapon can be used sort of as an approximation of a weapon, you can use an appropriate dice for that. So if you broke the leg off a chair and hit it at someone, uh, the DM could say, that counts as a club and then you'd roll the dice appropriate for a club. Finally, I wrote out the remaining features. Uh, Hermit gives the feature discovery, Tavern Brawler is listed there. And then he's going to be playing as a Frenzy Barbarian, a particularly terrible subclass, but uh, appropriate for this one shot. So we'll see how it goes. So printing the D&D character sheets or using printed ones is the pretty much bulk standard classic way of doing it. But you can also use like a fillable PDF version, which follows pretty Pretty much the same principles. It has the convenient factor that you can just simply enter text rather than having to write it out. However, there's a couple of flaws with this. The problem I have with uh, the fillable ones is that filling information that is likely to change can mean that you have to print out a new form every time that changes, especially in low level campaigns. Your AC may change rapidly. Certainly your hit points and things like that change every level. So usually pencil and paper would be my preferred way to do it. But there are actually some really cool tools that are available out there. You can get whiteboard dry erase pads that just hold the, the raw and most important changing information. They track your current HP and status conditions, which can be a way to use things like pre-filled character sheets to then keep the more frequently changed features on a separate thing at the table. Now, Rob's character was the second most complex character of the three. He had chosen the name Volaril Aedel, and he was a level three cleric. Initially, I'd made him the noble background, but 
ultimately I decided to change him to being a guild artisan and chose the like a guild of healers or apothecaries would be an appropriate background. And that just affects some of the base proficiencies. The process with this character is much the same as I described with Jazz's. Uh, not much is different between creating different characters in a setting. However, Clerics do have spell casting. For the purposes of running a one shot, rather than letting the players prepare their spells, I was preparing it for them. It's important in this context, we're only playing one session, they won't be getting long rests. There'll be no opportunity to change their spells. This way, rather than sort of presenting the players with like whole tombs of spells to pick from, I just kind of gave them some spells. And Rob had set me up with pretty much a terrible character. So I thought I'd just give him the prepared spells that would allow his character to do well, A, what his subclass kind of expected him to do. I gave him augury and suggestion for his second level spells and then the spells command and identify which are sort of automatically these are the four that are given with the um, knowledge school which felt appropriate for the type of cleric he was going for. He was a cleric who was denying divine healing so I didn't want to go cleric of life and we're only using core player handbook rules so with the Cleric of Knowledge, using the core spells that the class was given just felt natural. For cantrips, I chose Mending, Spare the Dying, and Light, three of the most pragmatic uses of magic that his character could have, which felt especially appropriate for the Surgeon, who may need light in the dark, or may want to fix a tool, or twine, or thread that he's using to sew a wound shut, rather than actually, you know, magically healing it like a sensible cleric. Now, I realized that because he chose a character that had, well, no melee weapons, no armor, uh, and no combat applicable spells, he had one spell slot left and I gave him inflict wounds. I couldn't quite do it. I couldn't leave the cleric as a dud. So I figured at least he's gonna have a level one spell he can reliably cast that's going to dole out damage. And that pretty much sums up the process for the fillable stat sheet. Like I didn't go into too much detail with this one because it is fairly well exactly the same as I described for Jazz's. You fill out your attributes, you fill out your skills, and then you leave some areas blank just to fill them with a pencil, such as the current hit points, death saving throws, and things like that. And finally we come to D&D Beyond which of course has a lot of upsides, a lot of features, but doesn't come without downsides. Now, D&D Beyond is pretty amazing. Uh, you go to the website D&D Beyond and you make an account and then you can make a bunch of characters. The tool itself is very comprehensive and a really good spot to get started if you're just looking. Uh, maybe you don't own any D&D books, but you're looking at diving in and grabbing some. However, it's a little bit restricted in that it only has connection or access to features and things that you've purchased and owned through D&D Beyond. You can then choose your character creation method. I recommend standard method for most players and you can actually tick a little box that's helpful that says uh, new player like guiding information. Now there's a whole section for how to create your character, your character level, where you'd want to start. And it's really cool to read through this if it's your first time. If not though, you can pretty easily just skip ahead. The next page allows you to select what content you're going to use. There's a lot of non-official or non-canon almost in some people's mind options you can pick. But through here, it kind of sets up what the D&D Beyond machine, if you will, will actually allow you to use for your character. Here you can also fill out your character name. Now, Jeremy's character name is Yorick Grange, and he's a halfling. So there's also this really cool portrait selection tool, which has a lot of portraits that you can pick from, but you can also import your own portrait. Eventually, I picked the stout looking uh, halfling up the top, mostly because I couldn't help but be amused by it. So <laughs> there he is, Yorick Grange in all his glory. Clicking across, it says to choose a race. Now, if you're not using those alternate rules, the race will affect your character's attributes. Uh, and I knew Jeremy wanted to be a halfling. He hadn't selected a particular subtype, but I felt that the Lightfoot Halfling was the best choice for him, given that they are small and fast and they can hide easily. One of the great things about D&D Beyond is this selection process is all very, very visual. It gives you descriptions that help you through each part of the process, but it also is quite easy and clear to see what exactly you're picking. So as I got to the Choose Class section, I could quickly select Bard, but then you can see in Bard that I only had the option of one subclass. That's due to the fact that my D&D Beyond doesn't have the 
the books related to the additional subclasses. This didn't matter though, because we're only using the player's handbook for this. So it was fine to just be limited to what I had access to. In here, there's a lot of drop down menus that allow you to choose your musical instruments. I find this personally so much simpler than paper sheets and having to write out all these little extra features and extra traits. So after going through all the drop down menus, selecting bonus proficiencies, expertise, all the various things that a bard gets, you can see I've made Yorick into a beast of skills. He will be the one making a lot of skill checks, performing, etc. But then we get to the ability scores and the ability scores actually lets you select the method you'd like and explains them, which makes it really easy. You don't even need to use those uh, external character websites for selecting your attributes. When you're using d, &D Beyond, it's all built in. So I selected point by, chose the character traits I expected that Jeremy would be happy with. So he's very charismatic, very dexterous, pretty much the optimal build for a basic bard. I also gave him a bit of intelligence to take care of a lot of those skill checks that he will have proficiency with. Then we move through, you pick the background, all of this stuff that you do from the PHP and we did on our paper sheet, uh, you can do much easier on D&D Beyond. Just clicking drop down menus, selecting options, equipment, everything like that. However, I do find that once you actually have your character initially created, adding equipment or adding things and then making sure they're equipped, etc., is a little bit more clunky in D&D Beyond than just having a paper character sheet. Luckily, however, if you do like the ease of creating your character, but also like having something physical on the table, you can actually just export these as a PDF and then print them. So while you would have to do that for each level or each time you have an ability score change, uh, it is quite easy to print these ones out and then simply use them as your character sheet. So there you have it with Breg, Tempestrom, Valaril, Laradel, and Yorick Grange. We have three D&D characters built in three slightly different ways. I hope that gives you an idea of some different ways to tackle getting into making a D&D character and specifically filling out your character sheet. It's all pretty self-explanatory. The paperwork looks like a lot, but when you really get down to it, it's just checking boxes and adding one plus two equals three sort of kind, like really basic math. With that said, you've had a look at the characters we're going to be playing very soon in our role-playing session. I guess tune in next time and look forward to the joy of um, Yorick playing music and not having a good weapon. It, it's going to be fine. It's all fine. It's fine because at the end of the day, Bragg is going to break a chair over someone's head. So on that note, um, thank you all for watching, like, subscribe. This was a bit different. So comment if you want more kind of instructional weird stuff like this. Thank you for watching and thank you to all our lovely patrons. Yes, that's right. This is a role play video. So I guess patron scroll? Just to say a special goodbye, we have my friend, Jen's owlbear. This owlbear is very special because inside its small intestine, a role play dice. That's right. Bye everyone.